You know, that there are, there are stories in the Bible with, this, with the same enduring proposals, uh, uh, scenes of romance that would make novels blush, you know. Uh, there's the story of Jacob, who, who worked for seven whole years for, uh, to marry the one that he loved, and then he had to work another seven in, in addition before he could marry her. Uh, Queen Esther won the king's heart by her drop-dead beauty. Uh, Boaz let Ruth have some extra grain to pick up in front of her. That's a little odd. Uh, <laughs> King Solomon wrote one of the greatest poems ever written about the love that he had for the Shulamite girl, uh, his beloved, that we now know as the Song of Solomon. In it, he says things like, your neck is like a tower, <laughs> and your teeth are like a flock of sheep. Uh, got to remember that. <laughs> but you have to admit that the most romantic and also the most reassuring story is the story of Isaac and Rebecca. The, the Lord directs the faithful servant to just the right place, to just the right girl that says just the right thing. I mean, it's perfect. It's beautiful. Now, I like a good adventure movie, like, uh, uh, as much as the next guy, but every now and then, I, I, I like to watch a good, feel-good chick flick, you know? <laughs> uh, I must admit, I'm, I'm a bit of a hopeless romantic, and I get that from my mom, by the way. Uh, one illustration that has appealed to me is how God has described his relationship with us in an almost romantic way. God has used our understanding of marriage and love to represent how he would like to relate to us. And this illustration is used in significant ways in the Bible. God used this lover imagery in perhaps the most vivid sense when he described Israel's unfaithfulness to himself. He began with with what only I can describe as a love letter, so full of love and longing and also regret and jealousy. Listen to what God himself says in Jeremiah, um, to, to Jeremiah the prophet in chapter 2. This is God speaking. I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me into the wilderness in a land that was not sown. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. But next, you can hear the longing and confusion in God's own heart. Verse 5. What wrong did your fathers find in me, that they went far from me, and went after worthlessness, and became worthlessness? They did not say, where is the Lord who brought us out of the land of Egypt? Verse 7. And I brought you into a plentiful land to enjoy its fruits and its good things. But when you came in, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The shepherds transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Can you hear the Lord's heart breaking in this passage? Middle of verse 11. My people have changed their glory for what does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Verse 31. Then why do my people say, we are free, we will come no more to you? Can a virgin forget her ornaments, or can a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. I'll finish with Jeremiah 3.6 when God is really angry and completely betrayed. Have you seen what she did, that faithless one, Israel? How she went up on every high hill and under every green tree and there played the... And I thought, 
After she had done all this, she will return to me. But she did not return. But now, um, now we, we haven't maybe gone up onto every high hill and sacrificed, uh, I mean, burned incense to uh, Baal. But unfortunately, I know that this metaphor parallels our lives way too much. We too have served other gods. And throughout the entire time that God is courting us, wooing us, and drawing us closer to himself, throughout this entire time we are resisting him. We seek after lusts outside of him. These cherished sins of the world that we cling to keep us from making the commitment to Christ we really need and that would truly and fully satisfy us. Instead, we want an open relationship with our Savior, so to speak free to see other gods. In our culture today, we are very non-committal. We don't like commitment. Our, our, our cell phone bills, our, our cell phone contracts last for two years at most. You know, and, and our marriages <laughs> may be that long. You know, we are terrified of commitment. But our God is a jealous God. He is loving, he is caring, he is kind, but he's not a doormat. Hosea was a prophet of God, and God told him to go marry a prostitute. And this prostitute was to represent the relationship that, that Israel had to him. Boy, God... Uh, then when Hosea had his, uh, well, when his wife had her first child, it was a boy, and God said, name this son Jezreel, which is essentially saying, Jezreel means a punishment will come upon you. And then after that, a year later, she had a daughter, and he said, name this daughter no mercy, because I won't have mercy on Israel anymore. And then, after the third son was born, he said, Name this son not my people, because Israel is not my people anymore. In Hosea 2.2, God says, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, and I am not her husband, until she stops her gallivanting, I'm paraphrasing. Please read these chapters for yourself because there was so much I couldn't put in here. Uh, and it, it, it really shows a side of God, a passionate side of God that you don't get it anywhere else in the Bible. You don't understand this until unless you read this. So the first and second chapters of Hosea. God continued in verse 7. Then she shall say, I will go and return to my first husband, for it was better for me than now. And she did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil, and who lavished on her silver and gold. I will chase her and hedge her in with thorns, keeping her from the veils she wants so badly. This is like a soap opera. It's so vivid. But then the Lord laments, and you can hear the spark of hope that he has in his voice. For the woman, this, this, this people that he loves and is so jealous for and wants back so close to him. Amen. After this, therefore, behold, I will allure her. Allure, what a beautiful word, allure her. And bring her into the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. And there I will give her vineyards and make the valley of Accor a door of hope. And there she shall answer as in the days of her youth, like things were, as in the time when she came out of the land of Egypt. Skipping to verse 19 and 20. And I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord, verse 23, and I will have mercy on no